This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 183, recorded on August 9th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hello there. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can't ask for more. Getting younger by the minute. <laughs> yeah, you're reversing the normal. I know, depression. boy. If only <laughs> there was a there was a movie about that. Benjamin That's Button. Right. That's right. That's right. I was not in it. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How's South Carolina treating you? Well, we finally got out of the rain period. It was raining three times a day, and it was raining <laughs> about an inch every time it rained so we were canoeing to work there for a while <laughs> so better and better raining than burning i tell you my tomato plants in the backyard had mushrooms that i had never seen before it was a weird mushroom in that hey, it grew take a up picture and send it to me i i should have it, it melted the mushroom melted i've never oh, seen it melt was it coprinos a uh, inky cap <laughs> <laughs> I, it, it was a something. It was orange. It was orange. Oh, yeah, orange. Those orange, orange. guys melt. Yeah, I've oh, had those. It's not an inky cap. Yep. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Great state. The ladies have taken over politics, I understand. <laughs> we made a pretty good showing. I'm I'm excited. Excited. I think About it's great. Time. I think it's great. So uh, in addition to life, um, <laughs> unseen life on Earth, I am thinking about the sun because as some of our listeners may know, NASA is about to launch the Parker Solar Probe that mm -hmm. is going to go within the sun's corona. And my brother-in-law, Andy Dreisman, is a program manager on that project. And that okay. means my whole family is um, having a reunion down at the Kennedy Space Center where we are going to be able to watch it live. Nice. Well, that's very cool. Yeah. So in the wee hours of Saturday morning. Off the probe goes That's to cool. collect data from the sun, the sun's corona, solar winds, and all this cool stuff. That's very exciting. So, How long does yeah. it take to get to the sun? Well, the whole mission is about seven years, but I think they're going to start getting data back um, in November. Nice. Seven yeah. years. That's about the length of a Legionella experiment, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just or a PhD <laughs> student's initial foray into graduate school. <laughs> That's right. But, <laughs> the, the NASA website has put out a lot of information. So if anybody's curious about how they're this is designed, how they're going to use Venus to kind of slingshot and get closer and closer um, to the sun, uh, they've got some great graphics to describe it. Neat. We'll take. We'll put it in the show notes. Very nice. I just want to remind everyone we are going to give away a book today later in the show. So stay tuned. Never know when it's going to pop up. So just keep listening. Today we have two very cool stories from you for you. And from some of you, actually, who are listening. The first one was sent by Chris, who writes, Dear Vincent and Twim Gang, after the great coverage on our preprint of the Bodo Saltans virus on TWIV, I thought I would send you another preprint from my PhD for consideration. This time, it is a parasitoid bacterium of a heterotrophic protist, hence TWIM that has no metabolism on its own and instead relies exclusively on the host by remodeling its mitochondrion to scavenge everything, even ATP. If that wasn't strange enough, it doesn't do binary fission either. Well, okay. Yeah, Alio we'll <laughs> objects to that, and we'll, we'll discuss that later. Thought it would make a fun little snippet. Thanks for all your great podcasts. This would be perfect for Halloween, but I guess we'll, we'll do it <laughs> close to Labor Day instead. Absolutely. So this is Chris's um, second paper. The first one, he published uh, Bodo Saltans virus, which is a, a virus that infects, it's a, it's a Mimi virus, a giant virus that infects mm -hmm. um, aquatic protists, 
and has very interesting features. And now he's got this very interesting, and these are both uh, bioarchive preprints. This one is called Chromulinavorax destructans, a pathogenic TM6 bacterium with an unusual replication strategy targeting protist mitochondrion. And so Chris Deeg is the first author, and this comes from the laboratory of Curtis Suttle at the University of British Columbia. Chromulinavorax destructans. And this study, the discovery of this uh, interesting bacterium started as an effort to identify pathogens that infect protus zooplankton. And what they did, they sampled freshwater habitats in southwestern British Columbia for particles smaller than 0.8 microns. So they filtered the water and they want things smaller than 0.8 microns. Then they take that filtrate and they have cultures of protists growing in the lab and they infect and they see which one gets infected. And this screen gave rise to a pathogen that infects a host called Spumella elongata. Spumella elongata. That's the host. This it sounds like pasta. I know it's a little Italian. Italian. Right? Spumella. Yeah. Spumella is one of Earth's most abundant phagotrophic nanoflagellates. So phagotrophic means it takes up particles and eats them. It preys on bacteria, viruses, and even other microbial eukaryotes. Nanoflagellate, well, the flagellate part you get. Nano, they're about 2 to 20 microns in size, so they're pretty small. And these phagotropic nanoflagellates, together with viruses, uh, result in lysis. They're the primary mortality agents of microbial populations in aquatic environments. So this paper is about the revenge of the microbes. The revenge of the <laughs> microbes, that's right. Spumella, the host, is found both in fresh and salt water. So the name they named this agent Chromulinavorax destructans, C. destructans. And it happens to, infection seems to be specific for the strain of Spumella. And this is an interesting result. If they treat the cultures with ampicillin, vancomycin, and rifampicin, this uh, C. destructans is still able to grow and kill its Spumella host. But he forgot one antibiotic. Which one? That he forgot the trimethoprim sulfa or the instructive class of antibiotics. And I lay you dollars to donuts mm -hmm. that that antibiotic, the, the sulfur classes of antimicrobials, would likely inhibit this microbe based on the story you're about to tell us, Vincent. Okay. So keep that in the we'll back of your mind. mind. It's a good point. So the ampicillin and the vanc, they hit the cell wall, right? Correct. So either... And you need actively growing cells in order for mm -hmm. those antimicrobials to have an activity. Okay. And so either they're not growing or there's no cell wall, right? Mm -hmm. so that's one mechanism of resistance to antibiotic. Lose the targets. Right. Yes. And the rifampicin hits RNA polymerase. In which case you would say, well, this uh, chromulinovorax must uh, not be, it must not have an RNA polymerase, otherwise it would be inhibited, right? Mm -hmm. it, maybe it's the, the host cell Paul that's being used. So these, what are these C destructans? They're cocci, 350 to 400 nanometers. They have a lipid double layer. There's some electron dense material in the periplasm. There's also a nucleoid. And when you stain these particles for DNA, they have a homogeneous staining profile. So in other words, they all have the same amount of DNA, which the authors say suggests that they don't replicate outside of the host. Because if you just take the, the, uh, the cocci themselves, they all have the same amount of DNA. Now, what happens is you, inf you add this uh, C. destructans to the host cell, to the spumella. <laughs> huh. the, the, uh, the C. destructans are taken up. These are phagotropic hosts, right? So they, they grab this, the uh, seed destructans, they take it into a food vacuole, and uh, then by three hours, there's a spherical mass in the cytoplasm, and the mitochondrion of the host cell begins to wrap itself around these seed destructans. By nine hours, the mitochondria completely surrounds what they call a replication body, which is the uh, seed destructans that has been taken up. The mitochondria all 
appear to be in, appears to be intact. There's a single mitochondria that surrounds this replication body. By 12 hours, the mitochondria takes up two thirds of this spumella cytoplasm. And these electron micrographs that they provide are really spectacular. Yes, and you, mm-hmm. this is a bioarchive paper, so everyone can mm-hmm. see it. It's open access. This uh, replication body begins to divide and make mature cocci, and uh, eventually the, the host cell bursts open and they come out. This is a lytic bacterium, all right, and it's kind of behaving a little like a virus. It's, in, it's infecting a cell. It's, it's duplicating itself, and as you'll see, it's a highly reduced bacterium as well. But dramatic impact on the mitochondria, the powerhouse. It's amazing. Of the host cell. It's amazing. Yeah. It but it's still intact because the cell yeah, that's right. needs its energy. It's a true parasite. Yeah. Right. So they sequence the DNA. It's also not the only bacterium that infects mitochondria. That is true. Uh, I've forgotten the name of it. There is a guy who, in cockroaches, lives in the mitochondria of the cockroaches. Hmm. Uh, I'll look it up. So uh, let me ask you. They call this a lit- a lytic bacterium. Are the, what other examples are there of lytic bacteria? They get inside another uh, cell and cause lysis. Della vi- de vibrio. Mm-hmm. I, I, or, I'm, how about rickettsia? Rickettsia. Yeah. Rickettsia. Yeah. Rickettsia. Yeah. Legionella also ends up being um, the, the host cell lysis. It's it's not clear whether that's a host defense or it's a bacterial program. But okay. All right. So they sequence the genome. It's one million. 174,272 base pairs of circular double-stranded DNA. So it's pretty small, and it encodes 1,081 open reading frames. Most of these encode proteins involved in DNA replication, protein synthesis, uh, as you'll see, transmembrane transporters and host manipulation. But a lot of these open reading frames, they don't know what they do. There are all 20 amino acyl tRNAs. Uh, there are co- there are some ribosomal RNAs, but it does not make a complete ribosome, so it doesn't have a complete protein synthesis system. So obviously, it's but dependent. it does have it does have uh, RNA polymerase. It does so have it RNA polymerase. resistant to rifampicin. Yes, that's absolutely right. It has to be re- resistant. Uh, it has a DNA replication and repair machinery. There's a single origin of DNA replication on the genome, but it's clearly highly dependent on the host cell. It uses nucleoside nucleoside salvage for purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis. It can phosphorylate the products into the required nucleotides, but it needs the precursors from the host. Uh, Amino acid biosynthesis uh, is restricted to conversions between related amino acids, has a rudimentary cell division machinery. Uh, It has no lipopolysaccharide biosynthesis uh, capability, but it can make peptidoglycan, and they wonder if that is the electron-dense material that you see in the cyto- in the periplasm. And no complete metabolic pathways are encoded in this genome. No complete metabolic pathways, just bits. There are lots of transporters to import peptides, amino acids, lipids, elements like iron and zinc. So obviously it's getting these from its host. Right. It's scavenging, scavenging instead of building. Hmm. There are two copies of an ATP ADP antiporter. So this would be a membrane complex that would exchange ADP for ATP, and mm-hmm. and, and they, bring stuff in. And that seems to be getting it from the host, right? And that's why the bacteria are probably right next to the mitochondrion. They get a steady supply of ATP, and this antiporter allows it to get into uh, the C destructans. If I may interrupt, I just happened to look and found a paper with a tantalizing title. It's a review paper in um, a journal called Biochemical Pharmacology. It's called Mitochondria, a Target for Bacteria by Lobel, Lelison, and Arnold, which are investigators in Belgium. I'm going to send you the reference so you can put it in this in the, yeah, uh, very good. In the notes, okay? Yes, be great. No genes for lipid metabolism, so it gets its lipids from the host. Many of its genes encode proteases, nucleases, and hydrolases, again, breaking down host cell structures and importing them. They ha- the genome encodes 98 copies of what are called anchorin repeat domain proteins. And these have unclear functions. They are implicated in membrane modification and counteracting the host immune system. They have a secretion system 
probably used to export proteins into the periplasm. And uh, the last thing I want to tell you is that these cells, C. destructans, remain infectious after being stored for four years at four degrees Celsius. <laughs> not is, frozen. Not, not frozen. frozen. Wow. I wonder, I wonder how they, I wonder if that was planned. <laughs> well, they're not burning anything. The, remember, the thing that ages all cellular life is metabolism. Mm -hmm. So if they're not effectively doing any metabolism, they're not taking all the oxidative hits that is a consequence of, of normal life. And they're sort of cheating. They're sort of cheating in that they're using the host mitochondrion to take all of the, if you will, free radical hits from metabolism. So this cell mm -hmm. is yeah, yeah. really very clever. And they go in, uh, the author goes into his, in the discussion about why the, what's the evolutionary rationale for it being so long lived. And it, it really begins to make sense when you read those last snippets of his discussion. He, he points out that, you know, the life in water is not easy. What's the likelihood that you're actually going to find the spumella mm -hmm. in order to infect? And you have to be ready in order to be engulfed by the by the host and then take advantage of that. If you have to tool everything. Wait, 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 wait. You're, you're going into a different subject. You made a hell of a good point about <laughs> not having metabolism and therefore being not, not affected by, uh, by the oxidative, oxidative insulin. Now, now go into another point. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's the, um, the way they describe this candidate phylum, it's dependent, it's dependentiae. That's right. And it's really dependent upon the host and being able to find a host and it has a very narrow host range. This poor organism has to wait for the right match.com event to happen for it in order to uh, replicate itself. Yeah, you know, but many viruses have face the same problem, right? Finding a oh, host. Oh, that's absolutely but, true. But they degrade, you know, they don't last four degrees, especially they don't last forever. Oh, that's, that's so right. there's something different about this that's preserving it. Maybe its structure is such, you know, it, first of all, it has DNA, which helps a lot because if you have, yes. you have RNA, you de degrade very quickly, but the DNA may be protected in interesting ways. But, um, that, uh, I think that's a good point that, uh, they're just sitting there, but also the other point is they have to last a long time to encounter a host. That's pretty cool. This, this phylum, by the way, candidate phylum. TM6 or dependentiae. What else do we know about it? This their biology is known from only from reduced genomes recovered from metagenomes. So people sequence different environments and they find these in them. And there are only two isolates that have been described, and they infect amoebae. And so this is the first one that does not infect an amoeba. The third isolate which infects this uh, spumella. <laughs> so I, I was attracted because it's got viral characteristics. Well, that's why I wanted to ask you. Do you think this is not a bacterium, but could be a virus? Is it, does <laughs> a cell need to make energy and have a metabolic system in order to be quote alive? Or is this a true bacterium? Uh, Alio, Alio, what were you, th you were talking about this before. What, what are your thoughts? Okay, my point of view is that what makes a virus a virus is that it loses its bodily integrity. Okay, no. that's that's the definition of a virus to me, and it is reconstituted using host machinery. This guy doesn't do that. Although highly dependent on the host for its metabolism, it does not lose its bodily integrity. It looks, for, in fact, the schematic diagram that they have in the paper, which is gorgeous makes it look almost exactly like Delo Vibrio, except mm -hmm. that instead of going into the periplasm of a bacterium, it goes into mitochondrion of a flagellate. But otherwise, it looks like, almost exactly like Delo Vibrio. So I don't think that losing metabolism alone makes a bacterium into a virus. It makes it into something which is degraded, which is very weak, if you wish, 
But to, to be a virus, you have to really fly apart in during replication. So That's the, my view. So the the only problem with your view is there are some viruses that do not lose their bodily integrity. Okay. Okay. They, for, for example, the That's re, because the, biology is that way. Biology yeah. is an exception. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that the the definition is uh, for a virus is that you make new viruses by assembling individual components, whereas Fine. bacteria you make more by binary fission. Fine. And so the question is: Does this organism, yeah. this Chromulinovorax, does it do fission? And I think probably it does, right, Elio? It does. It does. It just yeah. doesn't do it. Look, this is this is a strange form of binary fission in the sense that instead of dividing right away, it first makes filaments and chains, and yeah. then they break up. But it's the equivalent of binary fission. I mean, it's not a filamentous bacterium does the same thing. You know, it's not yeah. that different. Right. Another a- approach to the debate is to look at the. Um, phylogenetic relationships of the proteins it does encode and see whether they're more bacteria-like or virus-like. It looks like, based on the nomenclature, that they're bacterial of bacterial origin. It does, yeah. Uh, There's an FTSA, FTSZ, for example, that right. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. cell division machinery. So that, that really smells like bacteria. Mm-hmm. Peptidoglycan. But this may be on right. the way to becoming a virus, right? You know, one of the uh, theories possible. for it's viruses possible. is that viruses... And I, I think what, what uh, Michael said earlier makes it makes a lot of sense that this is really a solution to an ecological problem. And mm-hmm. that this guy has a particular solution to it, namely surviving by not having metabolism. <laughs> I mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. But then it's pretty aggressive when it does get a host. Yeah, the fact right. that it can divide within 12, I mean, it's start to finish in 12 hours post-infection, which is pretty remarkable considering how long it can remain dormant. Uh, this guy will belo- belongs in the scheme of parasites, strict intracellular parasites. And I don't have any question that there's going to be a lot of phylogeny and a lot of that kind of a study is being done. And it's being done now. I mean, mm-hmm. The Kessia, chlamydia, et cetera. You know, there's a lot of there are a lot of intracellular, strict intracellular parasites in the bacterial world. Right. They're they're fascinating. Each one has its own specialty. Anyway, thank you, Chris, for sending it. It's really cool. Yeah. But, and uh, presumably it's submitted somewhere, so good luck with that. Well, he's got a typo in his material methods that says <laughs> C chapter two. Yeah, I saw so, that too. That, that's in sampling. <laughs> that's, so we're, that's, we're oh, that's from his thesis, probably. Right? That's thesis, right. It's sure. a direct lift. <laughs> so, so we're doing a little editing for bioarchives. You know, he's got a he's got to fix that in the sampling section of his material methods. Yeah, cool. All right, thanks everybody. Alia, what do you have for us? Well, I have a paper which is related to the subject. We don't often have two things that are related. The title is recurrent. Symbiont Recruitment from Fungal Parasites in Cicadas. It's by uh, several Japanese and Chinese authors, a, one from the University of Montana, or two from the University of Montana. The authors are Matsura, Moriyama, Lukashi, Vanderpol, Tahahachi, Meng, uh, McCutcheon, and Fukatsu. And this is a fun paper because cicadas are interesting in that they are insects which make a lot of noise when they try to mate that's their <laughs> their characteristic by the way they, I, I looked it up the, the noise they make is actually more like drumming than stridulation in other things like in crickets they 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 rub uh, legs again one against the other it's called stridulation here it's more like they have uh, like beating on a drum anyhow <laughs> they make a lot of noise at night they have one interesting problem that they eat. Their sole food is the xylem of plants. It is a sap which is very poor in everything except sugars. It's about, it's essentially, it's a sugar solution. These guys are like drinking Coke they, they, all day long. <laughs> so they're computer programmers. They just drink you know, sugared beverages right. all day. 
We'll get letters. Anyhow, so where do they get their amino acids? Where do they get those vitamins? And the answer is they get them from bacterial symbionts. Mm. And this is a long story that a lot of uh, plant-feeding insects, especially sap-feeding insects, have to have this. And Wolbachia comes into the picture, and so do two organisms, two bacterial symbionts called Sulcia, S-U-L-C-I-A, and Hodginia, that's named after somebody called Hodgkin. Anyhow, that's the story, basically, is that the symbionts provide amino acids and vitamins to the cicadas, and the cicadas are very unhappy if they don't have them because they starve to death. Okay, however, like many, many bacterial symbionts, and just like the one we just discussed, Sulcia and Hodginia have tiny little genomes. So much so that the, the typical genome of a Sulcia is something like 200,000 bases. That is nothing. I mean, it's really less than some viruses have. But, but it's stable. Sulcia does the job. It has the genes for a bunch of the missing amino acids. By the way, the cicadas can make, insects can make certain amino acids. It's like us. We have essential amino acids which we need to import from our, from our food and non-essential, which is the ones we make. Same thing with the cicadas and other insects. Anyhow, Sulcia does the job for some of them and Hodgkinia does the job for Hodgkinia, does the job for others. However, these very reduced genomes, I mean, they're tiny. I mean, you know, they, they, what, what is it? You know, they, they really um, code for maybe 200 genes, you know, which is considered less than what is essential for life, for independent life. And sure enough, these bacteria do not live by themselves. They have to live inside of their endosymbionts. They have to live inside of host cells, which provide them with a lot of the necessary food. A story very similar to the one we just talked about in the case of the... Um, Destructans. The, <laughs> right. Anyhow, the problem here is that Surcia does fine, but Hodgkinia does not. And if you look at the Hodgkinias in various cicadas, these are Japanese cicadas they look at, you find that the genome of Hodgkinia is not in a single molecule, but it's broken up in various mini circles, which reminded me of the kinetoplasts of trypanosomes. That's mm -hmm. another story we can talk about sometime. Anyhow, so they have mini circles instead of having a single molecule, a single chromosome is a, is a single molecule. And these get lost. So Hodgkinia is on the way out. It's not, uh, it's possible that Sulcia may be on the way out too, but slow, much more slowly because it's still there. But the Hodgkinias are fragmented and um, differ from regular uh, endosymbiotes, from other Hodgkinias found in other cicadas. So this is characteristic of Japanese cicadas. Okay, so missing our genes for essential nutrients, namely histidine, methionine, the other amino acids being supplied by the Sulcia, cobalamin, and riboflavin, in other words, vitamins. So how do the cicadas cope with the dire need to acquire nutrients that are essential to them when they are missing, when one of their partners is bugging out? <laughs> <laughs> no pun. Okay. That's right. No pun, in, pun intended. Okay. Pun intended. The answer is that of all things, they acquire new endosymbionts, and these are not bacteria, but fungi. Wow. This is news. That you can substitute a bacterial and the symbiont for a fungal one. I don't. I don't remember running into this in any in any case. Uh, does it sound familiar to any of you? It sounds almost like mutualism, where the cicada sure. is desperate to get the amino acids, and it'll take them from anyone who can contribute. Well, this is mutualism, all right, no question. Although, but to your uh, point, Elio. The first author, uh, Dr. Yu Matsura, for years was looking at these uh, this interaction and trying to understand what was happening in these cicadia. And he, too, was just thinking about bacteria, bacteria, bacteria. And then by looking in the microscope, he was just stunned to see these pockets of fungi, mm. which right. had just not been on the radar screen. So, yeah, it's a, it's a surprising and fascinating new biology. 
<laughs> it's interesting. The only took is looking under the microscope. I mean, you break up a cicada, and all of a sudden, the outpour of this this fungi, this yeast-like fungi, and you got the answer. I mean, this is really yeah. And at first, he thought <laughs> so, it was just that particular insect had a fungal infection. Uh-huh. But when he began to see it consistently and then do the um, molecular genome analysis, uh, the story becomes more clear, as you'll tell us. Yeah. So what are these fungi? Well, they are an interesting set of, uh, they belong to a group called the Ophiocordyceps. Tease that into two words. Ophio means snake-like and cordyceps are fungi that grow on insects and they're well known, the Ophiocordyceps because they, some of them enslave ants and other insects, teaching them to grow, to, to climb up plant stalks where they, they reach a certain height, they impale themselves with the mandibles and the fungi which grow in the brain, which is a good place to grow if you're gonna modify the behavior <laughs> of your host, <laughs> they come out of the brain as a floating body. You may have seen this. This is in National Geographic all over the place in, on television. You can see that. You probably, many of the listeners know what I'm talking about. You find ants and other insects, um, uh, weevils, for instance, impaled up on a stalk, and out comes a very bizarre looking fruiting body, which is a, a stalk and a sack of spores at the end, sort of a little. Uh, I don't know what to call it. It just looks very funny. And eventually, the sack of spores opens up and the spores are distributed. And the simple, the simple thought is they do this because by being up in the air, they have a better chance of dispersing their spores than if they're on the ground. If they're on the ground, it's going to be a problem to spread the spores around. But up in the air, well, the wind will take care of it and spread the spores all over and the fungi are very happy. Not so the insects. <laughs> the insects dead. It's a bad the science fiction movie. At that point. That's right. Anyhow, the um, here the Ophiocordyceps do something different. Okay, they do not kill the. They do not modify the behavior of the host. At least they're not known. This these particular ones don't seem to do that. But they uh, provide the host with its amino acids. And sure enough, uh, at least one of the symbionts, which can be cultivated, by the way, most of these fungi cannot be cultivated. And they think that that may be because they uh, are advanced in their relationship, that is in their evolution. And they've evolved that they don't have to uh, grow outside the the body of the insects. So why should they? But this one, one symbiont of a cicada called Maimuna opalifera, whatever it is, is it's a Japanese uh, cicada. Here they can cultivate the organism, and when they do, the yeast, I imagine they, uh, they find that it has a whole lot of genes for essential and non-essential amino acids, vitamins for nit- nitrogen recycling, and it includes the genes that are normally provided or were, used to be provided by the Hodgkinia. So they say these results highlight metabolic versatility of the fungal symbiont that is more than sufficient to compensate for the absence of Hodgkinia. So that is pretty much the story, but there are a few more points. They ensure, to ensure that these fungi are passed along Mind you, they don't grow outside, very, they may grow outside the insects, but are not known to do it. But they just ensure that this isn't a problem. The fungi are located not just in symbiont carrying structures, which by the way are common in insects. When they have bacterial endosymbionts, they have specific structures called bacteriomes or bacteriocytes. But in this case, the solsia also grow in the developing oocytes. In other words, they ensure vertical transmission from insect to insects. So uh, that is an amazing bit of evolution where you substitute the ability or the necessity to provide necessary nutrients from bacteria to a, where the bacterium, in this case, one of the bacteria seems to be on the way out, on the way to, to be obliterated. And this is now substituted by a fungus. 
So uh, this is an amazing piece of, of evolution. It's interesting, too, that this fungus, which can be quite pathogenic, right? It can uh, grow inside the insect and then burst out of its brain and, others, and kill right. it. And, and now it's been, through the course of evolution, tamed, if you will. Um, now right. the insect that's... is exploiting the fun- fungus to uh, generate amino acids that it needs. It's amazing. It's a nice point you make. It's a nice mm-hmm. point. It tells you, show, it shows you the connection, evolutionary connection between uh, parasitism, mutualism, if you wish, uh, and how these things are really interrelated and they can go from one state to another. Let me, let me read the last sentence in the, in the paragraph, I think, in the summary. The author say these findings highlight, highlight a straightforward ecological and evolutional connection between parasitism and symbiosis, which may provide an evolutionary trajectory to renovate deteriorated ancient symbionts via pathogen domestication. Hmm. Exactly what you just said. Yeah. It would be interesting to know what changes occur in the fungus to do that, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. You can cultivate at least one of these fungi. You should be able to study the more detail. Yeah. I imagine they, they started on this. And I'm sure they're going to do much more. So, Elio, at some point in the future, the Hodgkinia will be gone, I presume, right? It's already gone from some. Some of the some of the cicadas, yeah. Do you have any idea of how long ago uh, these uh, fungi came in? So they did a phylogenetic analysis that they include mm-hmm. in their paper, and they also make the point that on three separate occasions, fungi have been That's exploited. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so three separate events in the history of this um, coevolution. Yeah. But I didn't recall um, how many years ago they estimated these events occurred. I love this phylogenetic tree because they have pictures of each cicada, which usually you just have the name. And here you can see which one is which. And I can see the ones we have in our backyard there. Wow. <laughs> the yeah, big they, ones. Ha- they have some beautiful photography um, in this paper, looking at the different sacks where the yeah. fungi are growing. And yeah, it's it's really exquisite. The, um, the first author is... Uh, Very thoughtful and uh, persistent person. Um, Again, his name is Dr. Yu Matsura. He is currently an assistant professor at the University of the Rakukas in Okinawa, Japan. He was actually born in Osaka. Um, His father was a math teacher who loved botany, and he himself just loved nature, collecting bugs, frogs, fish, other animals he'd capture in the neighborhood and then bring them into his home as pets. (laughs) He learned, though, after a while that his friends didn't share these interests. And so he kind of uh, maybe a little peer pressure. He he turned to other things like sports, but especially languages and studying the world outside of Japan. So when he um, began college, he actually started studying uh, foreign studies, languages and comparative cultures. Um, He has learned not only, of course, Japanese, his native language, but he speaks English, Hindu, and Spanish. And in 2002, Elio, he came to University of California, San Diego uh, for a summer okay. session. I'm yeah, I miss them. He told his parents, I'm going to study English and culture, but it was there that he took several biology classes and he learned that evolutionary biology is the most fascinating and fundamental field if you want to explore life on Earth. So at, during that stay in San Diego, he became determined to become a biologist. He also um, had been doing a, a fair amount of writing, or reading rather, um, news, media, textbooks, including Molecular Biology of the Cell and books by the evolutionary biologist uh, Lynn Margolis. He also read one by Ishikawa, who in Japan is a pioneer of insect uh, symbiosis research. So he then had to, uh, you know, return to Japan. He finished his Bachelor of Arts degree, got a job teaching English at a private language school that helped him, you know, support himself and really began to uh, explore this this new fascination with science. And then he realized that there are several universities in the area that would accept all of his credits that he'd earned both in Japan and in uh, San Diego, and that could jumpstart him to uh, return and get a second bachelor's degree, but this time in biology. So that's this what is he where? did. From, from UC, um, UC San Diego? Uh, no, he 
was back in Japan and he was uh-huh. now um, now enrolled in Osaka City University uh, where he got a second bachelor's degree, this one in science, where he was studying with um, Professor Numata looking at mangrove crickets, which are from his region in Okinawa, and also circadian clock and beginning to use molecular techniques. But one day uh, during that uh, undergrad period, he read an article by the senior author on this paper, um, Fukatsu, describing the pioneering work on aphids that had lost an obligate bacterial symbiont and instead had acquired a fungal symbiont. So it was kind of a precursor to this oh, study. Oh, I didn't that know that. So this yeah. is an antecedent to this story. That's right. So then he became very excited and and knew that he wanted to study um, with Professor uh, Fukatsu. So he got both a master's and a PhD with him and pointed out that this project um, took more than 10 years to bring to fruition because it was technically very complicated. And of course, they it took a while to appreciate that the fungi were were um, playing such a, a key role. So he especially would like to thank his co-authors on this paper, Minora Moriyama, who was the expert in cicadias and insect histology, and also Tanahashi, who is an insect-loving mycologist who's very good at culturing um, fungi and identifying them. And then he said they could never have um, done any of this without their uh, collaboration with colleagues at the University of Montana and co-authors, um, Piotr Lutusik, Dan Vanderpool, and, and John McCutcheon. I asked if he had I, any I know advice. John somewhat, and I, I oh, like yeah? him very much. He, he got his training with Nancy Moran, who's one of the leading people. She's now at Texas, used to be at Yale. One of the leading people in the subject of bacterial and the symbionts and the insects. Yeah, and I noticed that she was the editor who managed this paper for yeah, PNAS. Right. So he he clearly has got a, a great attitude and um, a sense of humor. He said that although it took them 10 years to gather the evidence for this publication, he recognized there's a parallel. It's just like cicadias that spend a long time underground to <laughs> only to emerge and sing. <laughs> so they are they're singing now. So yeah, I he's got he a PNAS a, paper. Yes, that's right. I asked if he had any advice, and he says, well, first, I feel like I'm just starting my career, but but he does say, if you want to find something new, keep looking, and again, pointed out that just by using a standard light microscope and, and being thoughtful and with an open mind, he was able to uh, recognize those uh, symbiotic fungi within the insects. So he says, even though we've been doing microscopy for hundreds of years, it still can lead to inspiring results, um, things we can't see with our own eyes. So he encourages people to look at things with a fresh point of view. You're going to have challenges and feel dumb, but keep pushing. And says that we're lucky to live in this era when we have research tools and information that's openly shared. We can have collaborations. And that's really um, made this project very rewarding and exciting. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. I, I want to point out that on a recent episode of This Week in Evolution, we talked about a fungus that manipulates the behavior of flies, similar to what Elia was saying. This is Entomophthora. And in this paper yes. from Mike Eisen's group, they found a virus in the fungus in the fly. Oh, yes. Wow. And they're wondering if the presence of the virus actually confers to the fungus some of its behavior manipulating abilities. So that's another cool story here as well in these cicada fungi maybe there are viruses in them that do something making the best of a bad situation yep (laughs) (laughs) and you just as as he said you just have to keep looking you'll find interesting things right right thank you some people think that viruses are important some people do (laughs) yes it just might be let's read a couple of emails michael this first one has your name on it can you read that uh it says hi twin peeps We really can't win where microbes are concerned. People are now dying from microbes splashed up from sinks due to increased attention to hand washing. I wonder if this also ties in with the change change from copper pipes to plastic. I'll bet it does. Discuss. Drains of sinks, which can be potential reservoirs. Is this you or the author writing this? Uh, That is from the Stat News article. Okay, so the Stat News article writes... 
Drains of snakes, which can be potential reservoirs for nosocomial pathogens, have been implicated in an increasing number of outbreaks in the past decade. It has been speculated that these outbreaks might be an unexpected consequence of efforts to improve hand sanitation in hospitals. Backsplash with contaminated droplets onto nearby surfaces where medical staff prepare tubing and other special equipment used in patient care is thought to be a mode of dissemination. They give you the reference, which I assume Ray will put into the show notes uh, on this from Stat News, and this is from 2016. So it's about two years old, but there is an increased frequency that we're seeing more and more about sink drains being implicated. And then the author or of this note goes on, biofilms containing colonies of these bacteria form in the sink drain and in pipes that drain the sinks. And again, another reference to the stat news. Replacing contaminated sinks and their nearby plumbing may not be sufficient as the biofilm may regrow from plumbing that remains in the wall. And then there's a reference to a ProMed article. And the author, Steve Lunton, from Bedfordshire, England, concludes by saying, time to put the traditional copper plumbing back, I think. <laughs> well, you know, the... Um, built environment of hospitals is being carefully looked at by architects. And one of the solutions that the architects have come up with is they simply change the location of the faucet and the drain so that the faucet nozzle is not directly above the drain, Mm -hmm. which is contrary to what you see often in your normal lavatory sink in your home bathrooms. Normally the faucet is directly above the drain in case you have a drip or something running. And folks have appreciated this, and people have been studying drains and the pathogens for 30-plus years, trying to understand the plasmids, and they, they've they been looking at the multidrug-resistant microbes. And, and I don't think, short of throwing the water out the window, we're, we're going to be able to get around this because, you know, sanitary sinks are a fact of life, and hand-washing is so important in breaking the chain of transferring microbes from patients to the environment and vice versa, that I think uh, the risk far outweighs any of the benefit that we would receive from not washing our hands with sinks. But Michael, this, the drain pipes, they were never copper, weren't they? Other things besides uh, like iron They're probably cast, cast iron. Most yeah. of the drains in old homes are cast iron right. pipes. They were rarely copper. And in fact, in research labs, if you remember back to ancient times, they were glass. Yeah, right, right. Mm. We had a lot of Mm. glass frames. I'm sure Michigan still has, over in the chemistry building, still has a large number of glass piping that take care of the organic acids and Mm. acids that are routinely dumped down the sinks. So, so back to hospital sinks, something else I've learned from my uh, Legionella colleagues who are environmental microbiologists is an unintended consequence of the low flow uh, design so that we um, mm-hmm. aren't even using um, faucets anymore. We're uh, stepping on a pedal and just get water on demand, that there is significantly less flow through those pipes and therefore greater opportunity for biofilms to form. Mm. That is indeed true. Yeah. So we're saving money on uh, water, (laughs) but we're the unintended consequences is higher risk for nosocomial infection. But given the recent current events in poor California, you can understand the need to conserve water. Right. Poor Californians are are desperate for water. Yeah, not kidding. (laughs) And I think the whole state's going to eventually burn. Mm. Yes. Michelle, can you take that next one? Sure, it's from Jonathan. In drinking water and wastewater treatment, we routinely use Cololert by IDEX for identification and quantification of fecal coliforms and specifically E. coli. At my wastewater treatment plant, we sanitize the effluent water using chlorine gas dissolved in water to produce at least one ppm after 20 minutes. Drinking water standards are, of course, different. Would this treatment produce viable but non-culturable bacteria? And would the EPA approve detection methods that fail to detect them? I've been listening to TWIM for about a year, and I really enjoy you all and the enlightenment your podcast provides. 
I did two years of undergraduate work, one in physics, one in biochemistry, before I left school to raise children and incur consumer debt. (laughs) I've been a wastewater treatment operator for seven years. Appreciate your time and efforts in education, says Jonathan in Waco, Texas, where at the time he wrote was sunny in 89, but forecast to reach 102. (laughs) Michael, this refers to your paper on VBNC, right? And I think the answer that Professor Kievel's data suggests that any oxidative insult probably sends a significant fraction of the population into a VBNC state. Mm. But for the most part, it will kill the bulk, but there's always some microbes remaining. So it gets back to what the US EPA and the water standards of your community require for uh, sewage. And I know for potable water, it's, it's a much lower number. And so again, the EPA is all about safety and making certain that we deliver potable water to our homes in a safe and effective manner. And I think uh, the work of Professor Kievel from Southampton really uh, brings a whole new level of discussion to uh, water and wastewater treatment given his data with BBNC. It's also uh, the case that our EPA guidelines were formulated when we were most concerned with enteric pathogens, so mm-hmm. things that mm. cause diarrhea, foodborne illness. Once we've, we've largely taken care of that with our modern wastewater treatment and, and water treatment, but now we're seeing that the Legionella and other respiratory pathogens that live in water um, maybe require a different uh, set of standards. Mm. So Things like cryptosporidium which is yeah. much bigger than Legionella. So Right, much bigger. Well, it's, yeah, smaller it's as not, a cell, but a bigger problem. Yes. <laughs> the poor folks in Milwaukee can only attest to that from a few years right. back. Kieran mm. writes, I graduated in engineering, but I enjoy your lucid reviews of papers in the biological sciences of which I know little. You people know your subject, at least I'm convinced. <laughs> Bring out real well, passion. We can fool anybody, can't we? <laughs> Bring out real passion and appreciation for the science involved in getting to the results. I catch you on Science 360. Great stuff. Kieran is from Wellington, New Zealand. Wow. Thank you. That's where we should go and do a twim away team. Sure. Love to go to New Zealand. (laughs) What time? Michael, can you take that last one, please? I'll take the last one. Tret writes, dear twim host and twimmers, my name is Tweet or Tweet as in Halloween trick or treat. I'm currently an upcoming to fourth year undergrad biology student at the University of Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Thank you for the wonderful podcast that had left me in awe at the end of each and every every one of them. I have a question for you guys. We hear, heard a lot about mutualistic relationships between bacteria and its host, like in the bobtail squid and human gut. However, in the most of the scenarios, the hosts are the ones that dictate the concentration of the microbes. Purging of human microbes is fecal matter, bobtail Mm -hmm. squid getting rid of the vibrio when we knock out the lux or luminescent genes. I'm just wondering if there is any example where the bacteria dictate the relationship, like turning on pathogenic factors to kill its host if the host stops providing benefits to the bacterial community. Uh, Thank you very much for the amazing podcast. I wish you guys successful episodes to come. Cheers from Canada Treat. That's a great note, and we thank you for your compliments. I was thinking about what happens when the poor host gets influenza. This is a paper that we did on one of our very early twims in which when the host gets influenza, the normal commensal strep pneumo that's living in your upper respiratory tract effectively no longer is a biofilm and then it goes deep into your lungs and effectively gives you frank pneumonia Mm, uh, as a consequence of you getting, of all things, the flu because you didn't get your flu shot, of all things. And so that's where the bacterium is sort of revolting against a viral attack. But to your specific relationship, I think quorum sensing and a lot of the complex communication that's going on between the gut flora and our neurosystem, we just don't have enough data to directly answer your question at this time. Hmm. But as as Elio often says, stay tuned. 
I'm sure we'll we'll find a paper about that very subject coming shortly. Uh, your your flu example is a good one, though. I like that. Yeah, you have a good memory. I forgot about that paper. All right, stay tuned. That's, we haven't given away the book. That's right. We're going to give away a book. Let's do it right now. I have a copy here on my desk of Antibiotics, Challenges, Mechanisms, and Opportunities. It's edited by Chris Walsh and Tim Wensowitz, published by ASM Press. Wonderful book. It is, um, I think it was 2016, has mechanisms, chapters for all different classes of antibiotics and sub-biosynthesis, opportunities for new development. Great book. It's yours. All you have to do is send an email to twim at microbe.tv with the subject line antibiotics. You have to do that. If you don't put it in the subject line, I won't consider you. Contest closes on August 30th. After August 30th, no more entries. And we'll take all the uh, emails and do a random selection. You can find TWIM at Apple Podcasts at asm.org slash TWIM. And of course, most of you listen on your phone or your mobile device of some kind. You use an app. In that app, you can search for TWIM and please subscribe. It really helps us a lot to have subscription numbers and you get every episode as we release them. That's twice a month. Now, Google Play Music also allows you to subscribe to podcasts and we have a link in our show notes for that as well. If you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a number of ways that you can do that. Of course, send your questions and comments to twim at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. See you next time. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. Thank you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support of TWIM and Ray Ortega for his ever excellent technical help. Music on TWIM is by Ronald Jenkins. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next time on This Week in Microbiology.